Hello. Well, my name is Antonio Gea. Um, I'm going to, to try to initiate a travel so we can understand how the ecosystem, the open source ecosystem evolved. We were going to look to the history and understand the economic and the social events that were able to create these big open source projects like OpenStack and Kubernetes. So, if we look at the history, at the history at a glance, we can, st we can see that everything started when people realized how to create computers, how to program them so the computers can do what we wanted them to do. That's how I try to explain my kids, how the <laughs> software and the computers work. So at the beginning, in the 50s and 60s, almost all the software was produced in, produced in the academic and the corporate researcher. So it was only in the reach of some privileged people that were able to, to develop software. And at that moment, there were any problem. They shared the, all the code, all the experiences. But everything changed when in the, I think that was in the 74, the, the US government decided that the software can be copyrighted. So, and let me try to d go deeper into this. Is to understand the copyright, we need to understand that how it works. So, the copyright is automatically attached to every novel expression of an idea, whether through text, sounds, or imagery. So, the creator has the right to commercial exploit that expression of the idea. Also, it's der derivative work. There is an exception that when you are working for hire, these copyrights belong to the companies, doesn't belong to the person. So at that time, in the, in, in the 70s, people started to realize that they can take a competitive advantage of, of these copyrights, and they started to exploit this. As you can see it in 75, and in, in 77, Microsoft and Apple were founded. So that they, I don't know, these companies are 40 years old. So, and they is, that is the reason why it started. They started to take up in touch of the copyrights of the software licenses. They created these software licenses to be able to monetize the software written by others. Because, because of this, um, uh, this way of treating the software, some people like Richard Stallman uh, initiated the, the new project. So they wanted to create software for free. They were promoting the freedom in the software, so everybody should be able to, to write code, to redistribute code, and nobody can take or exploit the, the software. Okay, what happened at that time too? At the beginning of the 80s, there was the, the computer industry started to commercialize the, the personal computers, like the Sinclair CX80 or the IBM personal computers. So this means that more people was starting to develop, to work at home with uh, their computers, to hack and to get interested in software development. During that time, Richard Stallman started to create the new project. He wanted to create a free operating system for the people. He wanted to create software for free uh, that everybody should be able to use and to redistribute without any economic exploitation. In that, in that decade, in the 80s, at the end of the decade is when internet started to connect all these homes. So, the community started to get connected. And, and Richard Starman was missing one of the most important pieces for, for his project, that was the kernel. So it was back in 1991 when Linus Torvald just released his free kernel. And it wasn't only the, 
the free kernel, what he released. Because if you, let me, if you, if you read the Cathedral and the Bazaar by Eric Raymond, he, he made a, a great points because he studied the, 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 this particular event in the open source world. And he was very clear about that Linux Kerberos hack was not the construction of the Linux kernel itself, but rather his innovation of Linux development model. So if you check to some of the lessons that he learned from studying that model was, first is the importance of users, and second is that release early, release often, and listen to your customers. That are pretty similar to the agile principles too. So he achieved to, to engage with a lot of people, a lot of community working for free, creating an operating system that was in, was able to catch up with other proprietary software in, in less years, with other companies developing other operating systems, and in some aspects, it had improved the, and he beat the competition. It was then when people started to realize that uh, the open source, let's put this way. So the open source started to have an ideology part represented by the new foundation with Richard Starman that, and there were other more pragmatic, pragmatic uh, trend in the open source community. Some of them can be represented for Linux Tarval, Timor really, other people like uh, the Python creator, that they were thinking more that, okay, the software should be free, nobody should be able to exploit, but people has to be able to achieve money to, to, cons to, to live from that. Okay. So, uh, the, I think that the, one of the most important decisions was taken in 1998, when Tim O'Reilly hosted the, what it was called the Free World Summit, and later on was called the Open Source Summit. Then is when they voted to, to decide on what name they will put to this, to this movement, and they founded after that the Open Source, uh, with the OSI Initiative. Richard Starman continued with his Free Software Foundation and his career and his uh, going on and ongoing debate into the open source communities about the different ideologies and the different ways of uh, understanding open source. Okay. Mm, let me step back a moment. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I guess it was. So the thing is, uh, during that time, in the, in this, uh, from the 94 to the 2004, other events were, were happening. And the, one of the most important events was that the world, the world Wide Web. The World Wide Web. So the first graphical browser was created in, in 1993. And some companies started to commercialize its products and, and to use the World Wide Web to, to do business. And one of the most important wars during that year was the, the so-called uh, browser war between Netscape and Microsoft Internet Explorer. Because Microsoft, Internet, Microsoft was using his monopoly to introduce his browser, and Netscape started to to lose the battle in, the, in, the, in that economic ecosystem. Mm, what they decided after checking and reading the cathedral and the bazaar and seeing the open source movement is, well, let's open source our product. It worked for the other guys. Why is it not one going to work for, for us? But the problem that they had is the licenses. They, just, they were creating a private software with a lot of contracts, a lot of ties, and a lot of and a, and, a, and, and a lot of warrants that the current open source licenses were, weren't able to to fulfill. So 
they started to create the Mozilla license and the Mozilla Foundation, and they created the Mozilla project. So you can see that this is still going on, and it was a very clever and a very good movement on the side. After the browser war, it started the so-called dot-com bubble, and a lot of money went out of the of the ecosystem of the software ecosystem. But other other movement started that was the virtualization. So people started to have a lot of hardware, and VMware started to commercialize his first server virtualization product, and Amazon started to see an advantage in commercializing his resources that they were not using, and the cloud started. Amazon, Google, and Microsoft created their own public cloud offers, and in 2010, Rackspace with NAS, NASA joined it and launched the OpenStack project. In 2015, after the cloud, this uh, I, IAAS uh, movement, the Google, fund, the Google, Google and Linux Foundation created the Kubernetes project. So, basically, what they created is a phenomenon based on the, on the Linux experience the, and the Bazaar model. The OpenStack Foundation created an ecosystem where the companies were able to obtain indirect value from the project. And the product, the value was zero because it was open source. Nobody's going to pay for, because the license doesn't allow it. So, but the people and the companies were competing with, uh, to take the, the revenue from complementary service, for complementary software, complementary hardware, distribution and support, and other companies tried to build public cloud services in that space. You can see some examples as SUSE, Red Hat, and Canonical, Rackspace, HP. So what the OpenStack Foundation was able to do is to create this is a great study. I really recommend to read the study. It's linked in the, in the slide. It was able to recreate the Linux kernel, the Linux success, creating the Bazaar model. But in this case, they didn't get, they didn't get contributors directly. They get companies. You can see from the first releases that are the relationship between the companies. So in Ice House, the number of companies working in the project was so big that the project has beaten all the competence. You can see that when they started, they started competing against CrowdStack. They started co competing against Op Open Nebula and Eucalyptus. And the moment that they started to get this critical mass of companies, of uh, contributors sponsored by the companies, Companies wanted to put money or to get revenue from, from the, this movement, they started to, to get a pace and in innovation, in delivering, that nobody could compete. So the other projects, I think that they are still alive. But you can see that OpenStack was the only one that succeeded in the IAA's uh, ecosystem. And to understand that, we need to understand what they, were, what they had to do to do that. So first of all is the companies needed a neutral ecosystem. So nobody can own the project. Because if somebody owns the project, the other companies are not going to invest because they are in clearly disadvantaged. So the OpenStack Foundation is the entity that manage all this uh, contribution, all the, all the technical resources, all the technical infrastructure. So it was founded in 2012, and his main goal is to provide an independent home. So all the, all the people in the project can be sure that it's neutral, that nobody has any favor from it. The most important thing that is changing these days is that 
At the beginning, the OpenStack uh, Foundation one was hosting only the OpenStack project. But now, and this, uh, we had a talk uh, one hour ago about this in this room, they are opening the, the foundation to the open infrastructure, uh, the open infrastructure community, and they are including new projects that are outside of the OpenStack core project. So what's happening? The Kubernetes people started with a, a goal of, of uh, creating a, what is the name? An orchestrator for containers. And in that ecosystem, there were two other companies, like same as OpenStack had Eucalyptus and the other Eucalyptus, Open Ebola. Uh, Kubernetes was competing against Mesos and Docker Swarm. But Kubernetes was able to do the same that the OpenStack Foundation did and the OpenStack project did. He was able to attract the massive mass of companies, of people, bringing so many uh, developers to the project that they are innovating at such a fast pace that nobody can catch up with them. And as you can see, they are starting more or less. Mesos was a, a big player on the ecosystem but Mesos was owned only by one company, same as Docker. So I think that from here we can infer that the neutrality of the, of the project is important, is important for the companies. And to do that, what Kubernetes did is, is when, he released the, when he released the first version, he partnered with the Linux Foundation to create the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So, he provided to the other companies this neutral referee to control the ecosystem and the project could, could, be, could not have any favor with any company. At least, if you see the, the evolution of the ecosystem, you can see that the, at the beginning, Google was more than 70% of the, of the project. And with the new world releases, more companies are, are starting to take over the project. So, I think that, that from this, we can, we can understand that it's important. How, this, how the open source projects grow is because they need a driver. In the case of Linux, the driver was the, mm, all this hacker community that wanted a, a free software, wanted ha to have a, operat a free operating system, and he was able to engage with all of them and to create this bazaar ecosystem that was able to, to innovate and to create better um, software and faster than the others. And I really think that these two foundations were able to do the same. He provided the ecosystem so the companies can, but in this case, these open source projects are not attracting people, are attracting companies that are adding people to the projects. And this is how, it's, how the projects are growing because of this. They are providing the neutral ecosystem so everybody can take their part of the stake so nobody is reluctant to invest on it. But there are differences between Kubernetes and OpenStack. Both, we can see that more or less they were working on different products, different ecosystem, one related to the containers, other to the uh, virtual clouds, but they achieved the, the same results with different ways. So to understand that, we need to understand how the projects are governed. In the case of OpenStack, OpenStack is governed by three separate governance bodies. The Board of Directors, the Technical Committee, and the User Committee. The Board of Directors is, well, as I told you, is who, who oversight the, the OpenStack Foundation, the assets, who sponsors, who deals with the ten, uh, sorry, who deals with the, who manages the IP, who manages the, the infrastructure. It's, okay. So, and this this board of directors is composed of the platinum sponsors, so the companies can can feel that they are not investing in the blind. You know? So they have a voice on the project. But the board of directors is not who 
list the project. So there is a technical committee that is oversighting the technical matters in the project. And this committee is selected by meritocracy. So the members of the, of the upstream project are, are electing the committee. And the technical committee had authority to determine who can be part of the project and who will not. But there is one exception. For the core open start project, the technical committee has to recommend to the board of directors the modules the module for addition, combination, split, or deletion from the core open start project. This is important because we are going to see how the Kubernetes and the Cloud Native Foundation is handling this. In this case, the board of directors has a word on the, on the technical side. This, there is also other user committee that represented the, the downstream users, but I think that is not important for, for this presentation, the role of this committee. If we go to the technical part, the, technic the way that OpenStack is organized, so OpenStack, as we told before, this, there is one OpenStack core projects and there is these new projects that work differently. Let's analyze the OpenStack core projects that were the ones that uh, created this, this big project, like it's called OpenStack today. So, for each of the projects, the community or the people contributing to the project choose a PTL. The PTL is the, the people that manage the day-to-day -day operation, that drive the team, that, that resolve the technical dispute, disputes. He's in charge of managing the, the, the project, it's the project inside of OpenStack. And above him is the technical committee. This is the way that more or less, uh, OpenStack handles the technical issues. It defines a project, the project defines a PTL, and the PTL handles the project. If there are some cross relationships that need help, the technical committee chimes in and try to organize and, and deal with the problems and, and oversight that everybody is, is uh, fulfilling the, the four opens and the OpenStack way. And now that we talk about the four opens, this is important because this is something uh, interesting regarding the OpenStack project. So to be able to be part of the OpenStack project, you need to follow the OpenStack way with the four opens. So one of, of, uh, of this, one of the important things here is what these four opens means. So one is that the project has to be open source. That's important because as we say before is the, the the code has to be open. You cannot have licenses or or any copyrights that made the product the project uh, closed or that can deal with liabilities. So the other is that it has to have an open community. But here I highlighted one word. It's the open community statement imposed that this should be public and in IRC. So this is something interesting that we are going to see after that. It's we, one of the four opens is imposing one tool, that this is going to be funny for developers <laughs> for sure. Other is that the open development. And here we have, I highlighted two other things. Here is imposing two other two conditions. So the project has to have code reviews in the OpenStack infrastructure, and it has to be test driven by the gate in the OpenStack infrastructure. And the last of the four open is the open design. So the open design has other conditions that Everything has to be discussed in the OpenStack dev mailing list. Okay, so far so good. The four opens rule uh, look really nice to me, and I really think that they are able to to achieve what OpenStack wants. But what I want to highlight is now the difference with how Kubernetes is handling this. You know? I don't want to to make 
an impression that I'm, I'm in favor of one or the other thing. I'm just stating what OpenStack is, is what are the OpenStack requirements to have a project in the OpenStack world. So let's go to the, to the other project, to the Kubernetes project. So as, as I say, this, the Kubernetes project get released with the vers version 1.0 1, 1 in 2015. And for that, what Google did, did is to partner with the Linux Foundation to form the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So they saw the model. We have a foundation. The foundation handled handle everything. So the companies can put their money and we can create community. We create community. We create, uh, we accelerate the development and the open source project can, can succeed. But this is one of the main difference. So the Cloud Native, uh, the Cloud Native, Cloud Native Foundation is totally different to the Open Staff Foundation. It's only an, an administrative entity. They are only focused in organization marketing and strategy. They are focusing on only an oversight in the projects, but they don't impose any rule to the projects, just that they have to be related to the cloud native guidelines. And the governance models in Kubernetes is different. So you have a foundation and you have a, a project inside the foundation. The only need, in OpenStack we have a foundation, we have projects in the foundation, but the technical committee has to report some technical things to the foundation. This is one of the important details that I want to highlight in the, as the difference between both models. But let's see how the, the Kubernetes governance model works. What we see is that in OpenStack we have board of directors, technical committee, projects, and PTRs per project. What the Kubernetes governance model has is he has a steering committee, and this is important because it's all an important difference with the OpenStack model. The steering committee requires discretion and committees, oh, sorry, committees do not have open membership. I don't always, I don't not always operate in the open. That's an important difference with the OpenStack model. So we have a committee that can operate, that cannot operate in the open. And this is the committee that rule all the Kubernetes project. They have, and to be a member of the committee, you have to, to go to election and you have to be elected only by members of the project. And I'm going to explain after that how the members are elected in the, in the Kubernetes project. And and why it's so difficult, so different with the OpenStack model. So, mm, this, okay, so the committee is the, the, the entity that rules the, the project, but it has this special interested group that are the ones that rules the, the technical part of the project. And this is a totally different approach at the, in OpenStack. In OpenStack, you have projects per functionality, per network, per storage. And in Kubernetes, you have one project, and you have this special interested group that organize the, the, basic, organize the, the project based in different aspects. For example, this one C for scalability, this one C for network. So, all the code is in the same repository, but the different six manage the different, the different goals or scopes. In OpenStack, is, every scope is managed by a different repository, by a different project. All the interesting difference between both projects. Well, the six can have problems of communication, and for that, they create these working groups that are communities that are able to create and to deprecate that are organizing this, this uh, to handle this load and these uh, topics that doesn't require a seat. And this is what I wanted to explain. To explain is, for the steering committee, there is no 
there is no uh, criteria writing. So the committee can change the criteria. Right now, in the last election, everybody that was a member of the project could vote, but the contributor with uh, the contributors with, I don't know, some requirements, more than 50 contributions or people that were helping the project that could request to vote, could be eligible to vote. What that is mean? So, if we check to the, to the, try to gather some numbers to the presentation, I recommend, I suggest you to, to use these two tools. So, one thing of, of both projects is that they are really going to do the things right. And there are a lot of, uh, a lot of tools and a lot of uh, analysis and a, and, a, and a lot of statistics to analyze here. But the important thing that they want to highlight, let me step back, okay, is, okay. How can you be a member of the community? How can you have a vote? So, in the OpenStack community, to have a vote, you only need to be, to be a foundation member. You are a foundation member, you can vote. For that, I think that you only need to request a form. I don't know, and sign a, a, an agreement or a license agreement. That's it. So, if we see the graph, I don't see it. The OpenStack community, the data that I could gather from the annual report of the foundation is about 80,000 <laughs> members. So that's impressive. So I think that, I don't know if this is right. I get this, this data from the, so if everybody can know that I'm committing some mistake, just please let me know. But if this data is accurate, we can say that for the, to elect the foundation board to vote, you only need to be a foundation member, and right now there are 80,000 80, persons that can vote for the foundation member. What happened in the Kubernetes? Kubernetes doesn't vote for the foundation. They are totally independent of the foundation. They vote for the steering committee. The steering committee is the, is the entity that rules the project. And what do you need to vote? First, you need to be a member. And to be a member, what does it mean? To be a member, you need to be an active contributor in the community. And for that, you need, in addition to commit to the project, you need to be sponsored by two reviewers. And the two reviewers cannot be part of the same company. So they are creating this this kind of chain of truth, like in, when you are G signing your GPG keys, uh, and creating a meritocracy based on relationships and, and code. That's totally different to the OpenStack approach. So that means that if I write, if I write the current number of members in the Kubernetes project is 372, compared to the 80,000 that are in the OpenStack project. So these people can vote and can, check, can change the elections with their vote. The other main difference, and I added this smiley, is what most of the developers like is, they represent a totally different approach to development. So OpenStack is more, let's say, old school, in the sense that the main tools are Gerrit, uh, IRC, Mailman, Etherpad, Aspog. You can see this is one common, common denominator here. It's all these tools are open source. OpenStack is very, very uh, proud of open source and it demonstrates, uh, it's trying to demonstrate it, it every way. They are using open source tools for creating open source software. On the other side, Kubernetes is a cloud-native cloud project, and they are very cloud-native. <laughs> so all the tools are cloud tools. You see, for chat, they use Slack. For mailing lists, Google Groups. Collaborative, Google Docs. Super for, support forums, Stack Overflow. So this is, 
the, the profiles of the people is totally different too. If you go to one event or to the other, you can, you can notice these things too. And now what we can see is that the fight between the foundation is about to, what I explained before, is about to gather people, gather, generate expectation. And one of the main events to do, to do this is the summit. So OpenStack was able to, if you see the graph, OpenStack started the thing that was in Paris or in Austin. The first summit was able to bring more than 4,000 people to the summit and was able to keep the same page during a long time with a, with a big, big spike in 2016. But in 2015, Kubecon started to create his own summit. They started, I don't know, I think that it's about 500 persons. Six, six months later, the, more or less about the same people. But if you see the trend, you can see the, the expectations. So what this graph means is that something is doing the marketing people, at least in the, in the Cloud Native or uh, Foundation, something is doing great because it's able to go from 500 in 500 person in 2015 to 5,000, same as OpenStack in 2018. And this week, these two events are competing. So I will be really looking forward to seeing those results. The other comparison that we can do is the, the, about the contributors. We were talking about people that is member. Member can be anybody, but the project need, needs code, needs people coding, and this graph is interesting. OpenStack was able to, to gather such amount of developers that were able to, to have in 2016, more than 3,000 contributors committing call to the project. It started with about 5,000, and, 5, and in 2016, they reached the, the, the top with more than 3,000 contributors. Right now, you can see that the number of contributors is decreasing, but it still is higher than the Kubernetes one. And you see the Kubernetes one? It started in, in 2015, but the project was initiated before. I don't remember. I don't recall. It started the year. So they have more pull request creators and pull request reviewers in 2015. But you see how the trend is similar to the Kubicom. They are, they are getting momentum, and they are able to match the OpenStack numbers. But currently, OpenStack is it still has more mom power or more contributors than Kubernetes does. So what I try to highlight is the difference in the projects, not in technical differences, how the projects are governed, how the communities are formed. What the question why that most people is doing is why, how is the project managed? Who is the community, who manages the community. And that was my intention and hope that this could clarify some of your doubts. So if you have any question. Hello, uh, I work in a bank and uh, so very often we have the question internally, should we involve ourselves uh, in an open source community? As we can see that uh, the major contributors are always uh, technical companies, like technical providers, and not uh, business uh, companies like bank or other kind of companies. Well, I'm trying to explain how the, this projects are so big. So you, see, you can see that they, they are big because the company sees that they can obtain one benefit. 
Investing in open source is always good because you are, not, you are always going to have a, a revenue. If you create open source software, it doesn't matter if the companies leave. You are always going to have the software. So for me, if I have a company of, of uh, I would always recommend to invest in open source. You can invest in the foundation, you can invest uh, adding developers, it's a good thing. It's up to you how do you want to invest. The important is that your code will be licensed so you can distribute the code and you cannot impose any copyright so nobody else can use it. I don't know if this answers your question. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Just one, one, uh, one question. Uh, can you please go back to the page which is showing uh, the platinum members and the projects, if you don't mind? What? Where's the friend? Uh, the platinum members of OpenStack and uh, the projects. The projects? Yeah. What do you mean? Like this? Uh, maybe before? This? No, towards the friend. Uh, yeah. Uh, this? No. Eh? Yeah. Uh, again, back, it seems like. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just uh, let me take a picture of this. Well, this is in the, uh, this is in the web page of OpenStack. So. Sorry, sir? You can, you can, this is the OpenStack.org web page, so you can get it from there. Okay. Yeah, I have the reference in the bottom. So, these are truly open source projects. Every, everything is published. But what I wanted to highlight is there are entities that are managing this project, and they are organizing everything. And they are very good in doing what they are doing. And thanks to that, we have the summit, we have the seven, so we have these open source projects that are sustainable. And that. Can I uh, uh, ask you something like here? If you see the platinum members list, uh, most of them, like uh, Red Hat, uh, SUSE, and uh, uh, Ubuntu is not there. Uh, like, they, they, they are the, the Linux people. They are more into, uh, into this. So why is that? Because they accept the open, uh, open source well, or the, they are good in doing the developments. Uh, I mean, w what is the reason for that? OK, let me, let me go back. I, I explain this here. So I have some, some slides to explain this. This is the, the software revenue model. You know? I see this is how the companies work. When you have proprietary software, what do you have? You have licenses. You have contracts. So you tell the people, you buy my licenses, my licenses, and your model is about new engagement. You need to engage and you need to maintain. That's the, what is the problem? Is the companies go out, the project is deprecated, the customer doesn't have anything. What the open source bring to the to this market? You, the project is free. You can take the code and you can compile yourself. But who is able to compile everything? Who is able? So that's why SUSE, Red Hat, and these companies grow. It's, we are going to do this stuff for you. So you give us a subscription, or you want a new feature. We can develop it. It's a new service. This is how the, the, the software revenue model changes with the open source. And this is why open, SUSE, or the, SUSE is in, and Red Hat and all these companies are in all the open source projects because we build open source and we, we, we have business around the open source. Uh, you mean to say that they were doing the same model before in, in terms of operating system, like? Yeah, that's just, it's, for, it's not only for open stack, it's for all open source uh, software. You know, we create open source software because our business model is about subscription. So you want to use open source software, but you want that the open source source software have, is compatible with your, with your operating system, you have the right kernel version, you have a bug, you want somebody to fix it, this kind of thing. Anyone else? Ah, okay, thank you. Well, thank you.